everyone. Um, I'm sorry I haven't um, done live videos in a while. It's been um, not a rough couple of days, just a mushy um, couple of days. Does anyone ever have a mushy day? Um, that's what I feel like I've had. Um, I don't binge watch TV and I did do some binge watching um, the other day. So that was unlike me but then I just I don't know in LA it's usually sunny and beautiful and nice and I, and it got rainy and um and I didn't quite know what to do with myself so uh you can't go outside you can't see the flowers remember the last video I was outside in the garden and it was beautiful and and um this time you know with all the rain and I like the rain in California it's nice um it it just kind of really hemmed me in more than normal and um and my, my son gets way more needy <laughs> than normal. And then I don't know what to do with myself. So, um, yeah. So it's been a mushy couple of days. Um, not lonely, because I have, I have wonderful people around me. But kind of, um, you know, you feel like you're at home. You should be working, especially in academic. I should be doing all of this all this crap and stuff and reading and I should be like just absorbing everything and I should have a brilliant expanding mind and um I miss the the buzzy kinetic activity of a cafe I miss that um joint energy of of everyone working towards whatever they're working towards um hey JJ how you doing hey Brian um so I, I just miss um, being able to go out someplace and walk from the parking garage at UCLA to my office. Um, that's exercise, you know, you forget how much exercise you have just by going out to your car in LA, driving to where you need to go, parking in the parking garage, it's like half a mile from your work, walking into your office, walking to work. And um, that's, it's something, right? And putting on clothes, I'm wearing clothes today. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I do look tired. I am. I'm getting. I'm. I am. I am. I'm. I'm good. Um, but you know, I I taught my um, online class today, and I'll do it again tomorrow. So that's closed two days in a row. That's a win. It's really good. Um, but I also thought I'd. Um, uh, you know, it's five. It's five here, so um, I think it's fine. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll cut it off at a certain point. But you know, um, we need to have. Um, some vices, though I think a lot of us have a lot of vices right now. Um, I check Worldometer too much, and then I start to think about um, people who aren't, do you know Worldometer, this um, website that tracks all of the reported cases, the number of deaths, they do it country by country, they do it province by province within a country, so you can get all kinds of information about how this pandemic is growing, where it's going, um, but, but then I keep thinking of this book that I'm reading right now for my new class, um, and how much people might try to hide the numbers, um, not report, um, they don't want bad numbers, they want good numbers because, um, power is connected to how, um, the elites support you, um, whoever those elites are, and then how the masses are, um, working with those elites. So if we understand in this book, Erica Franz is telling us that authoritarianism is a tripart structure between the leader at the top, the elites down below, and the masses below that. You need all of them kind of working in a balance and a harmony so that they're all um, feeling like they're getting something from each other. Uh, it is an interesting thing that the leader at the top and that the elites um, just below that would all try to um, not report full numbers. And, and um, a very good friend of mine, she's still a presumptive um, COVID-19 case here in California. So that was not reported. So every time I see these numbers in Worldometer, I'm like, should I double it? Should I triple it? What are the real numbers? I don't really know. Um, which brings me to um, sickness, death, and epidemics in ancient Egypt. I mean, who doesn't want to talk about that? It's an interesting topic, no? Um, yeah, you can get this book on Amazon. I got it on Amazon, though I'm trying to use other sellers. <laughs> I just posted about other sellers um, on my page, so you can you can check out other places to buy um, to buy books. Um, so 
in ancient Egypt and in the ancient world as a whole, life expectancy was much lower than it is today. Life was much cheaper than it is today. For instance, there are um, reports about expeditions that ancient Egyptian kings sent their people on to um, the Western desert or to Nubia, and they would put this great big expedition together, and they would pay the elites who were leading it a huge sum of money. Everyone down below just got a subsistence payment of bread and beer that they obviously brought with them into these desert expanses. And they say how many people went in on the expedition and how many people came out. And the attrition rate, the amount of loss, the amount of death on such an expedition was about 10%. So that's just an expedition out to get some gold for the king and all of the elites um, or to get other um, valuable metals or other valuable stones. And if you're willing to sacrifice 10% of your population to get a whole hell of a lot of stuff, then I think... Um, that says something about the society that you're a part of. And that makes me think of what we think the value of, of human life is in our societies. Um, I mean, just the idea of the 1918 flu, when you compare the numbers and you think of how many people actually did die in that 1918 flu pandemic, or you go further back in time and you think of the Black Plague of Europe and how many people died, maybe um, a quarter to a half of populations. I mean, it's staggering numbers that you cannot even believe. What happens on the flip side of such a thing is not a Great Depression, but is actually an upsurge in the economy because <laughs> there's... Um, there's people that are gone and you, you know, what's left, you, people are, are willing to um, push more um, or push all in and really create a better economy. Um, we are a different kind of society. We're not willing to take on that herd immunity at the expense of everyone and sacrifice that 10%, are we? We're not the, the society that sends 10% out on the expedition to get the rich people a bunch of gold and just say, okay, we're just openly sacrificing you, that's that. Um, that's interesting. Um, but I think that there's still some things that our society is willing to sacrifice. But if the ancient Egyptians were willing to sacrifice 10% of their poorer population to, um, to get a bunch of gold for the king and for the elites, um, all of them shared a lower life expectancy. All of them shared... Um, epidemics, and all of them shared um, a, a parasite reality that we can only imagine. And when I talk about that, I mean like, can you imagine being a wealthy person in ancient Egypt and just knowing that your body and everybody's body was infected with worms of some kind? Maybe you couldn't see your blood worms. So you didn't know you had blood worms, um, like hookworms and other things. But you could see worms um, coming out of other parts of your body uh, and, and you knew that they were living inside of you. Um, there's tapeworms, there's worms that exist um, even inside of tear ducts and other places. There's worms that, uh, that exist in joints and other places. And this is something that the human species just dealt with in a place like Egypt that was wet and moist and full of life like a I like to imagine it like a Dagobah swamp where Yoda lives, there where the force is strong with all of this life, right? Um, in Egypt, along the banks of the Nile with so much wetness, um, the parasites were, this was tough. And this wasn't something that the rich could really um, deal with that easily in comparison to the poor. Everyone had to deal with these things. One interesting way, and there, there's great debate about this, and I would like to hear what everyone here has to say. Um, one way of dealing with these kinds of infections, parasitical infections in particular, is to make sure that your water is always treated and clean. And one of the best ways to treat and clean that water <laughs> is to um, sterilize it in some way. I'll, I'll take a drink. Mm -hmm. And to make sure that... Um, it's, uh, it's been, um, it, that nothing can really live in there. To, to make it alcoholic is a very useful way of, of treating your water. So if you turn, if you, if you have a bunch of grain that's fermenting, pour a bunch of water into that, and then let it um, sterilize that water by becoming alcoholic through that fermentation process and becoming beer, that's a good way of making sure that you're not going to have a whole bunch of little parasites in the liquid that you're drinking. 
Um, there are uh, some historians who go all in with this and say Shakespeare was drunk for every play that he wrote his whole life. Everyone was drunk because everyone was drinking beer because the water of London was so dirty. And other historians are like, no, people drink water. You're crazy. This is wrong. Um, this debate in Egypt is not um, taken on as much ferocity. But I will say that um, drinking Nile water, if you live in Aswan, you're probably okay. Um, down south, you know, the source, closer to the source of the Nile. If you live further towards the delta, whew, you're going to have a lot of um, waste from animals and humans, the human animal in, in the Nile water, and your chances of getting infected with some sort of parasite are going to be that much higher. The delta is full of all kinds of vegetation. It's much richer. It floods all the time. It's just wet, wet, wet. And we all know that infections and parasites love to spread in a wet condition. So um, maybe the people of the delta were drunker than the people of the Nile Valley. I don't know. These are questions that Egyptologists haven't really asked. Um, it would be hard to compare the regionality of cultural drunkenness um, from north to south, but it would be an interesting research question to take on. Um, but, okay, so let's assume that parasites were something that affected rich and poor alike. You can also prove that epidemics of an infectious nature, viral epidemics, bacterial epidemics, also affected rich and poor alike. And there is evidence for a, a kind of plague, some sort of epidemic, maybe even a pandemic um, in the late bronze period during the reign of Akhenaten, um, earlier known as Amenhotep IV, around 1350 BCE, 1330, 1320. And that plague, it, it ripped through his own family and he lost um, at least one daughter and possibly a grandchild to this. He probably lost wives for, to this plague. And there are images of mourning uh, preserved in the royal tomb at Akhet Aten, the, at Tel El Amarna, in association with um, this plague, whatever it was, infectious disease, whether it was bacterial or viral, we don't know. Um, the exact nature of it, we don't know. But there is information that this epidemic came from outside Egypt, or at least it's blamed on people outside of Egypt. But I would caution us all to um, remember that the flu pandemic of 1918 was called the Spanish flu as a way of blaming it on people outside. And for the Egyptians, the, the pandemic under which they were suffering was blamed on people um, coming from the outside. So this is a typical mechanism for people in power to use to um to to take the the responsibility for dealing with such um difficult times and push it onto others so racism and xenophobia are connected to pandemics um and i i don't think that we should um be surprised by that um so the other things that that the ancient world and egypt in particular but actually no the entire ancient world had to deal with was a lower life expectancy for women because childbirth in the ancient world was so much more fraught with with danger um, than it might be in most places today. Um, I live in the United States of America, which uh, celebrates an over-medicalization of childbirth that I actually am really interested in. Um, and our maternal death rate is much higher than any other uh, developed, so-called developed country. And that's an interesting um, point to bring up. But um, in the ancient world, women would have had a, a lower life um, expectancy than men. It's kind of the opposite of what we're dealing with now and certainly the opposite of what we're dealing with with this pandemic, which is taking out um, so many of our, uh, of our venerable male uh, members of our society. Um, the one I noticed yesterday was um, John Prine. For those of you that, that listen to folk music, um, that one was, was sad. So I listened to Clay Pigeons about three times and I put my son in the bath and I'm like, listen to this song. Of course, I don't think John Prine wrote Clay Pigeons. Um, it's an older folk song than that, but it's still one of my favorite songs and I love it. So we listened to it many times. And then... Um, uh, Bill Withers uh, a couple days before, so I had him le um, listen to um, Lean On Me, which is um, a lovely song. If you don't know Lean On Me, I don't know where you've been living under what rock, 
But um, we listened to that one. And my son, who's almost 10, he's like, I think I know this song. I'm not sure. I might know this song. But that was, um, that was nice. But it's horrible that um, you read the news, see who's died, and then go to your Spotify to listen to a song from somebody who's now out there and not in their body anymore. Um, so, um, you know, the... I'll, I'll end it with <laughs> this, um, that, you know, the ancient Egyptians had these anxieties just like we do, but because they, I think, were faced with these anxieties of sickness and death, impending sickness and death, um, without denial, um, looking at it in a much more um, upfront way than I think we do, dying at home and not in hospitals, caring for the bodies of their dead rather than having some specialized people do it. Only the rich got mummification. Everyone else was dealing with this on their own. And I think that ancient people, um, pre-modern people, are are more connected to death and the processes of it and the impending nature of it, the um, irrevocability of it, that it is, you do not survive it. No one gets to get out of this fate. They were more connected to it than we are. And as such, they created a culture uh, of community to help them deal with that anxiety in a way that I don't think that, that we do, but that we may be forced to do now for the first time in many decades. Um, and, um, and we should look to them to see what, what you know, it's, it's easy to look at ancient peoples who go to uh, a healer, a medicine man or woman to get an herbal treatment and a prayer. It's easy to roll your eyes and look at them with disdain. This is a medical problem, you say, you know, go go to a medical healer. And yet with this pandemic, we see that going to the hospital does not always help that, um, particularly with all of um, the, the numbers that are going into some hospitals and so many people um, dying alone. Um, I think that... Um, it's, there's nothing wrong with bringing some magical herbal um, medical spells with you um, in some ways and, and looking at these ancient Egyptian methods of um, seeing death as a, as a transition to another place, um, uh, seeing death as a means of becoming something greater than you are, like in Star Wars when Obi-Wan Kenobi says, if you cut me down, I will be greater than you can possibly imagine. Um, the ancient Egyptians thought this way, and when their ancestors moved to the other side, they then were able to bring them back um, to them through prayers, letters to the dead, all kinds of communications, and found a way to um, connect with those ancestors more than they had previously. So, um, so on that note, I will try not to go so many days in a row without um, connecting with all you guys and um, all around the world. Um, yeah, we want to stay out of hospitals. So true. Psychosomatic. Yes, Brian, it's, it's true. Um, everyone out there, what did, I, what did I hear today? If you have a family member you haven't talked to in a couple days, connect with your family member, particularly those people that are alone in apartments or homes. Um, try to find community as you can. And even if it's here <laughs> with, a, with a Facebook um, video. And um, yeah. Just uh, keep keep doing it as you can and forgive yourself. So when you have a hard day like I did the last couple of days, I'm like, ugh, I just don't want to do anything and I suck at life. That's okay too. Um, we, can, we can do these things and um, know that everyone else is probably feeling the, the same way. Yeah, hashtag love your loved ones. Yeah, I like that. I like that. It's good. Um, so take care, you guys, and um, till next time. And I don't know, should I cut my own hair? <laughs> If anyone has any tips for how to do that, like, can you put it in a ponytail and like go whoosh, or something? Just, you know, let me know because it's, um, it's getting wild and crazy like Steve Martin. All right. Take care. Bye bye.